A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Lord God opens my ear that I may hear, and I have not rebelled, have not turned back. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pluck my beard. My face I did not shield from bufflet and spitting. The Lord God is my help, therefore I am not disgraced. I have set my face like flint, knowing that I shall not be put to shame. He is near who opposes my right. If anyone wishes to oppose me, let us appear together. Who disputes my right? Let that man confront me. See, the Lord God is my help. Who will prove me wrong? Verbo Domini. A reading from the letter of St. James. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith 
but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister has nothing to wear and has no food for the day, and one day you say to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you do not give them the necessities of the body, what good is it? So also faith of itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Indeed, someone might say, You have faith and I have works. Demonstrate your faith to me without works, and I will demonstrate my faith to you from my works. Verbo Domini Dominus vobiscum. Et hoc spiritu tuo. Lexio sancti evangelii secundo Marcum. Gloria ti et omine. Jesus and his disciples set out for the villages of Caesarea Philippi. Along the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They said in reply, John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter said in reply, You are the Christ. Then he warned them not to tell anyone about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed and rise after three days. He spoke this openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. At this he turned around and, looking at his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking not as God does, but as human beings do. He summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for, for my sake and that of the gospel will save it. Verbum Domini Last We welcome this morning the Knights of Columbus as they bring with them the silver rose which you see on the table in front of the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And there are actually four silver roses on their way from Canada through the United States and on their way to Mexico. 
and it, they will conclude their journey on the feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe on December 12th in Monterrey, Mexico, at the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe. And the Supreme Knight Carl Anderson commented on this program known as the Running of the Rose back in 2001, and he had this to say about it. Through it, we honor not only Our Lady of Guadalupe and express the unity of the order, but we also reaffirm the order's dedication to the sanctity of human life. It is to the Blessed Mother that we turn in prayer as we work to the end to end the culture of death that grips our society. As we think in terms of one life, one rose, it is most appropriate that we turn to Our Lady of Guadalupe, who made known her will through Juan Diego and the miracle of the roses. So we thank the Knights of Columbus for coming through and their witness to the sanctity of all human life. In the letter of St. James, we heard faith of itself, if it does not have works, is dead. And St. James is teaching us, of course, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that our faith must be put into action. And it is possible to lose this free and great gift that God has given us. St. Paul exhorts us to wage the good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience. And by rejecting conscience, certain persons have made shipwreck of their faith. And the Catechism tells us that to live, grow, and persevere in the faith until the end, we must nourish it with the Word of God. We must beg the Lord to increase our faith. It must be working through charity, abounding in hope, and rooted in the faith of the Church. So faith and works must be united together. St. John Chrysostom would say, just as faith apart from works is dead, so works apart from faith are dead. If we have right doctrine but fail in right living, our doctrine is useless. So too, if we are careful about life but careless about doctrine, that will not benefit us either. And this teaching of St. James is not new. Remember, our Lord himself said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And the Second Vatican Council would likewise teach us that even though incorporated into the church, one who does not persevere in charity is not saved. He remains indeed in the bosom of the church, but in body and not in heart. All children of the church should nevertheless remember that their exalted condition results not from their own merits, but from the grace of Christ. And if they fail to respond in thought, word, and deed to that grace, not only shall they not be saved, but they shall be the more severely judged. So we must respond to the gift of the faith that each of us has been given, that we have received. And we can't let our faith lie dormant in our souls it must be put into action. Again, St. James would call one's faith that is not put into action, or one's faith that does not influence the actions or the ordinary circumstances of our life, he'd call that a dead faith. And the faith of a person living in mortal or grave sin can also be seen as dead faith, because they don't have the charity or the divine life of God dwelling within them. In a sense, they've kicked God out of their souls. But thanks be to God for the great gift of confession in which one is reconciled to God in the church and can be restored to friendship with God, in which the divine life of God again comes and dwells and lives within us. And I think that this running of the rose program is such an example of faith in action. And the Knights of Columbus are giving visible witness again to the sanctity and dignity of human life. And we believe in the sanctity of human life from conception to natural death, but are we doing anything about it? Do we pray for an end to abortion? Prayer is powerful. I think we can take, we take that for granted. It's been reported that about 3,300 abortions take place every day in America. And we are in the midst of a culture that promotes death, death of the unborn, 
Instead of getting caught up in anxiety or simply giving up the fight for life, just thinking about those statistics, St. Paul gives us a first plan of action, and that is prayer. Again, because prayer is very powerful. In his letter to the Philippians, he writes, Have no anxiety about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So we can pray often for an end to abortion, for an increase in the efforts of the pro-life movement, for the conversion of physicians who perform abortions, and for conversion and light for the women and couples who are presently considering abortion. But our plan does not stop with prayer. Our actions will be made more fruitful and effective, however, with fervent prayer. You might consider joining the parish pro-life group, which regularly goes to the abortion clinic and prays and offers counsel to those who are struggling, who go to these places. Or consider going to the National March for Life each year held in Washington, D.C., or the one on the West Coast, or even local marches, again, that promote the dignity of human life. And we might ask, what does this have to do with me, or why should I get involved with this, with the fight for life? The fact is that if someone's choice threatens or destroys the life of another, it becomes our concern. This is particularly the case when the life that is threatened or destroyed is innocent or helpless. So may we pray for an end to abortion and an increase in the pro-life efforts in this country and throughout the world, and that we might receive the graces necessary to put our faith into action, witnessing to the faith that we have received, even every day.